Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Hello and welcome to the February edition of Read Smart, the official podcast for the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction. I'm Shahid Avari, academic, critic and broadcaster, and I'm standing in for our usual host, Razia Iqbal, while she's away teaching at Princeton over the next few months. The Bailey Gifford Prize rewards smart, innovative non-fiction writing across multiple fields, including history, current affairs, science and culture. We're immensely grateful to the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its generous sponsorship of this podcast. Today we'll be exploring the world of food writing, thinking about how a growing awareness of food poverty has impacted the genre and asking whether the industry has been able to respond to criticisms of elitism. Joining me are food writer, journalist and campaigner for food education, B. Wilson, who has her first cookbook coming out next year in the spring, The Secret of Cooking, and Tom Tivnan, who is a journalist, novelist and managing director of The Bookseller. So he knows a lot about cookery books and also collects cookbooks. B. and Tom, thank you for joining us. Hello. Hi. Hello. Happy to be here. Great to have you. Before we get into uh, our, our, our conversation properly, can I can I get you to clarify a key distinction that has emerged in this field of food writing and cookery books? What is the difference between a classic cookbook and, and what we, we might call more generally food writing for those who might not be familiar with the genre? Tom, maybe you could have a go at that first. Well, I suppose the classic cookbook would be one that has recipes and is more of a guidebook to how you cook in the kitchen, specifically. Uh, Food writing tackles things around food, uh, not just related to the kitchen, but perhaps the wider context. I mean, and it can go quite far afield, I suppose. Uh, Maybe a book like Fast Food Nation that came out about 20 years ago, so about how America specifically consumes food is an example of that. Um, I should say the distinctions are a lot blurred. Like you have writers like Nigel Slater or Diana Henry who have cookery books, but write really well and kind of go off when they're discussing a recipe on different topics. B? Yeah, I mean, food writing is something that encompasses almost everything. I mean, you could have almost any form of nonfiction that could also be Food writing. Food writing could be the biography of a chef. It could be, as Tom has said, a kind of political expose in the Eric Schlosser, Michael Pollan vein. It could be history, like Lizzie Collingham, biography of curry. It really could be anything. It could be memoir. I mean, I'm often struck. I've never really fully understood. Um, In the States, they seem to have a much greater appreciation for that slightly more expansive form of food writing. Mm. There's a food writer um, who was the American equivalent of Elizabeth David called um, F.K. Fisher, who just writes incredibly about food and herself, food and her own appetites, food and love. Mm. So, I mean, you can't really stop if you ask me, what is food writing? (laughs) What is a classic cookbook? It's a very specific and strange kind of nonfiction because it's a manual. So there's this strange relationship in a cookbook between doing and then text and then doing again. You know that the author of that book, whether it's Nigella, Nigel, or somebody from the past, did something in their kitchen, responded to it with their own senses, attempted to capture that on the page, and then you're going to go off into your own kitchen and attempt to do something similar. Mm. But through a process of Chinese whispers, you don't really know. But I think it's I think a classic cookbook weaves itself into our lives in a way that no other book does, in the way that I always think, you know, all of my children's birthdays over twenty-two years now have been marked by some form of Nigella cake. Mm-hmm. It's intimate that relationship. It's as if she's there with me. She's clearly not. I'm delusional. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a classic cookbook is slightly unlike any other form of nonfiction. Mm. I actually have my doubts as well whether it is nonfiction, but maybe we can get to that. Ooh, in a well, maybe I need to ask you about that in a moment about whether it's nonfiction. Um, but I, I want to ask about food writing now. Maybe Tom, I can ask you this: Who's the most interesting food writer around at the moment? Oh boy, that's <laughs> you can't say There's B, a... obviously. Yeah, well, I would say uh, <laughs> B has written several excellent books on. Um, about how we eat and the way we kind of think about 
what how we bring food to our table, which I think is a really interesting part of this conversation. Um, if I, I I really love Kate Young. She's uh, she's come out with three um, books a series called the Little uh, Library series. Um, basically, it's a, a cross between literature and cookery. So each recipe has a long essay, or no, not the shortest essay about what book can go along with that. The, the recipes within them are great, but I find myself I keep going back to these books and just reading what she thinks about, you know, how her love of Dickens relates to her love of tarts, for example. I, mm. And it's really lovely. If anyone who loves literature loves cooking, it's perfect. Yeah, perfect. B? Someone I really admire is a Nigerian food writer called Yamisi Aribasala, who wrote this book called Long Stroke Memoirs, Soups, Sex and Nigerian Taste Buds. And when I first picked it up, I just thought, who is this person? Her voice is unlike anything I've ever read mm. about food. She has a kind of fierceness in the way she writes about Nigerian food, the way the world doesn't yet know it, um, the spiciness, the pungency, the ways it's been misunderstood, the kind of absurd ways in which people speak about African food as if you could reduce the food of an entire mm. continent um, to this one thing. Mm. And she's funny. She's really, really witty. I feel like she is, um, this writer I've already mentioned, MFK Fisher, I feel she kind of is the heir to MFK Fisher in the way that she can write about food in a way that's both personal and very political. That's um, an amazing recommendation. We can look up both of those. Uh, 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 you mentioned the ghost written book, but are there are there chefs who are naturally great writers? Who comes to mind here, Tom? Uh, well, I suppose you have to ask their editors. Who really? <laughs> uh, um, I would say. I mean, if we're talking the top end, uh, and is there a distinction between people who come to this as? Uh, food writers and people who come to this as chefs. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know which way we want to go into that. Um, but I, I mean, Nigel Slater, I, I think, is probably the, the one, as I said, about the blurring of the lines earlier about between, you know, quote unquote, food writing and recipes. He's probably one of the best. Would, would uh, you say that as a chef, I wonder? Because I think of yep. Nigel as a home cook, like an amazing yes. home cook. The question of a professional chef who writes might be different. Mm. Yeah, it, right. Exactly. That's what I was trying to get at. Like, I'm not exactly, you know, you're not in that editing suite with, uh, with with the person who's going through the man manuscript. Tom Carriage, I think, is really good because um, he writes uh, not just about the food, but it, his whole oeuvre recently in the past few yeah. years is about his, you know, more about memoir, really, um, about yeah. his, you know, weight, weight loss journey, I guess you would call it, um, and he brings the personal to his cookery. Let me, let me ask you the question you just asked, which is, is, is there a difference between the the chefs who are coming to cookery books and food writing? i ask that question again. Is there a difference between the chefs who are coming to food writing and, and the cooks who are coming to food writing? Is there a, can, is there a, 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 a visible, audible difference in their, in their work? You know, I, I think there's an interesting shift um, if, if we're talking about the books market in this, in that if we went back, say, 15 years ago, a lot of the cookery books that were coming out were straight up chefs, people. And this is partly because uh, they usually came out of a, a nice lunch that a publisher had with a chef who went to the Michelin star restaurant and said, yeah, I'll sign you up. Um, I think the chefs that are coming up now are coming in from a different perspective um, mm -hmm. and a different, and this is partly to do with marketing more than anything else. The second biggest book last year was called uh, Jane Dunn's Jane's Patisserie about cakes and pastries, but her background, well, she is a chef. She owns a, her own shop, but she's also mainly known as a food blogger and Instagrammer. And that's kind of where the chefs are coming from now. These people with a ready-made platform that's, uh, publishers think that they can turn into sales. Mm. B, you also asked an interesting question a moment ago about whether, well, you were posing a, provo a provocation. Are, are cookbooks nonfiction? What do you mean? I mean, I suppose what I mean, because I was preparing for this podcast, I had remembered that ages ago I'd written something for The New Yorker about recipes and I went back and reread it. And 
what I was trying to argue there was that we own all of these cookbooks. I know that I do, even though it's kind of part of what I do for work. I'm also just addicted to them personally. And I have many of them by my bed as well as in my kitchen. And I'm just struck there's a huge element of fantasy there because Mm. we're sort of telling ourselves, oh, yeah, I'm going to cook all these things. But really, recipes are stories of pretend meals. And I see them as, as well as being a form of nonfiction, also one of the loveliest kinds of fiction um, with a kind of story arc from those tricky early stages of are you going to you know, manage to prep the vegetables and a moment of jeopardy as something goes into the oven. Right. And then you get this beautiful moment of closure at the end when the cake is finished. But it's mostly imaginary closure um, and you're tasting the food in your brain. Um, and I'm struck that, yeah, there are certain writers you might go to for that and that might be a different thing from cooking from a chef's book but I'm struck that people like Tom's already mentioned Diana Henry I think she writes beautifully I think Nigella really changed the form 20 years ago with how to eat because she was writing in such a proud way about food that was home cooking as opposed to what she called chefy food Mm -hmm. Um, and she was trying to say this is this is not worse than chefy food. In some ways, it's better, and it's something that's completely different. But there's a pleasure of just kind of consuming those words on the page, and it strikes me that actually that that kind of fantasy element of um, food writing has been there from the beginning. When I looked into the history of recipes a little bit, and they didn't used to be cookbooks, um, certainly not Instagrammable cookbooks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but there were in Renaissance times there were these things called books of secrets and what they fundamentally were was a combination of very practical instructions on here's how to preserve strawberries so they'll last through the winter here's how to make a great spinach tart and here is a cure for melancholy and here wow. is how you can restore speech that has been suddenly lost um, and I'm rather struck that in a way we're still going to cookbooks for this sense of remedy to make life better yes it, it does occur to me that keeping cookbooks by your bedside is also terribly hazardous because aren't you always starving <laughs> when you go to yes. bed yes <laughs> and then I've taunted myself by eating music <laughs> rather you, than you, hundreds of lovely things yeah <laughs> but you mentioned something very interesting there which is about the the Instagram chef you know the, and the recipes that go viral on TikTok I wonder Tom if you have a sense of how social media has changed the cookbook industry and, and has it had any impact impact on on publishing I, I can think of several social media cooks yeah. I, I mean utterly uh, if you look at the top say 50 authors in um, cookery right now I would say at least half of them are from the sort of social media world in some ways um, obviously the biggest one is pinch of nom uh, which is Kay and Kate Allison they recently got married um, who are the biggest uh, cookery brand, I guess you would say, if we're going to reduce two people to a brand <laughs> uh, in in the world, and they began essentially as a Facebook group. Um, Jane Dunn, who I mentioned previously, an Instagrammer, Joe Wicks, he became famous first on Instagram, and I would argue that Jamie Oliver's right now his main, you know, audience is on Instagram and TikTok. It's not on Channel Four, mm-hmm. so that. This is what publishers are looking for. This is what moves copies, I, I think. Um, Instagram, instant, incidentally, Instagram more than TikTok at the moment. Mm-hmm. TikTok hasn't really translated to cookery sales as much as it has in, um, well, it's obviously big in fiction and romance and sci-fi in particular. Mm-hmm. I wonder what sort of trends that you're you're seeing develop in, in food writing. What do you think will happen over the next few years, Tom? I mean, the main trend for the past three, four years has been uh, broadly under this umbrella of healthy eating, vegan and vegetarian. That's that's the kind of thing that say um, in about 2005, say the in that era, the the sort of vegan, healthy eating side of the market was maybe 10 percent of the market. The past three years, it's been 40 percent. and I think that's going to continue to run and run. Um, you know, one of the things that has come out of the pandemic is that there's a 
whole swathe of books that's about cooking together as a family, bringing in family recipes. There's this whole trend. That, and it's last year we had Jamie Oliver's Together was about bringing people together. Gino DeCampo had a really successful one called Gino's Family. Um, and there's this whole swathe that are coming out this year as well about cooking together. Now, obviously, that probably has some kind of post-pandemic thing about people having to be forced to cook together, perhaps not more than they have. Maybe they found it was great. Uh, I, I thought the opposite would have happened, that people, perhaps after the pandemic, people wanted to cook singularly because we've been together too much. But there <laughs> yes. you go. But, but what, what do you think? Because has, has the pandemic had an effect on our relationship with food and, and will that become evident in food writing? Well, it seems to have had... Um, as in other areas of life, a really divided effect, hasn't it? We know, insofar as we can measure these things, that there has been a rise in home cooking, which is wonderful. After all these years of people being told, you don't have time to cook, suddenly we did have time. Um, and, you know, all the cliches of banana bread baking and so on. Yes. But above and beyond that, it does seem as if more people have started to make home cooking a habit. So I think that's a great thing. But then we also know, I mean, you mentioned at the very beginning, there's this spectre of the terrible rise in food poverty, food inequality, um, huge rise of ultra processed food, which is kind of fancy way of just saying the opposite of homemade food. Um, So I, I don't know how that relates to cookbook trends, but I just see food, like everything else in society, becoming much more unequal and even more fragmented than it was before. Yes, I was going to ask you about about this, obviously, because you're somebody who campaigns for food education. And we've seen high profile campaigns like Marcus Rashford's and Jack Monroe's highlighting um, food poverty issues and the disparity between some of the government issued figures and what seems to be the reality for, for many people. And I wonder whether that will inflect the things that are published in food writing going forward. Um, what do you think, B? I kind of hope so. And I'm sometimes struck that if I look at um, 19th century cookbooks, people like Alexis Soyer, who was the great kind of equivalent of Jamie Oliver in the 19th century, amazing celebrity chef, um, and cookbooks today, I'm struck that up to now, cookbooks are very coy, modern cookbooks, about how much things cost, other than you know, notable exceptions like Jack Munro, who has been extraordinary, both in her... I think she's, when you were asking who's a good writer, she's an amazingly good writer. I think she's sometimes not given credit for how witty she is on the page, yes. as well as an incredible campaigner who is actually, along with Marcus Rashford, affecting real, very necessary change. Um, I don't know. I, don't, I, think it's, I think it's a huge entrenched problem of people living in these different bubbles. I think, you know, it's kind of, heartbreaking thinking um you speak to teachers and head teachers and children who already didn't have that much fresh food in their diets with the loss of the school dinners while they were away from school during the pandemic it's, mm-hmm. it's got worse and what I do um my food education charity it's called Taste Ed and we just create lesson plans so that teachers can bring fresh fruit and vegetables into the classroom and simply get children to respond to it with all of their senses. But I'm often struck, you know, the the aim behind that is that it's only one little piece of the jigsaw. You actually need to obviously make fruit and vegetables far more affordable, accessible, all the stuff Jack Munro is doing. But also, there's a real problem. If you've never tasted it before, you think you don't like it. So we mm. met British 10-year-olds who've never had a raw tomato. They've never held an onion. They've never felt a carrot. But I'm struck that part of what's happening, the teachers are reporting back, is it's sort of turning them into food writers. So once you place food in a child's hand, they can't stop speaking and writing. It's this incredible tool for literacy. So it strikes me that you kind of talk of food writing as this very narrow thing. Like over the years, because I used to do different kinds of writing, my background was as a historian. I sometimes would get this kind of almost snobbish thing of like, oh, why do you write about food? That's something almost irrelevant. And when I see the children interacting with food, I'm struck, no, to kind of 
kind of interact with food and use words to describe it mm. is a really basic human thing. I don't know where I'm going with that, except to say children yeah. are incredible. Food <laughs> yeah. If you just if you give them berries and say something like, what does it sound like? And they'll say, the strawberry sounds like rustling leaves or <laughs> blueberry is silent or it is like the plum is like squelching in the mud. How gorgeous. Um, it is gorgeous. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm trying to get to a question, Tom, about I, I think a, a long standing accusation about the f- about food writing and a, a, a cookbooks being um, a, a snob, uh, there's a kind of snobbery there that, that, that to be a gourmand is to be part of an elite and that certain cookbooks and food writing is for perhaps the middle classes or aspirational. And in 2018, Ruby Tando, the, the, the journalist and former Bake Off contestant, quit The Guardian claiming that the world of food writing was elitist. Is, is that still the case, do you think? I think partially it is. It definitely is. Um, you know, it, and there's you know, practical reasons for this. Cookery, costs of cookery books are probably the highest in most categories because it's a hardback driven, um, hard hardback, full color driven uh, genre, which means that, the, you know, they're, they're illustrated books and they have nice pictures in it. So, you know, you're starting at a regular list price, about 20 pounds usually for cookery books, for, for most cookery books. So the barrier to entry for a lot of people can be quite high. Um, but I think there have been moves to change this. You know, Jack Monroe, you mentioned, who's um, obviously that's part and parcel of what she does is to talk about this food poverty um, and the kind of disconnect between working class people and um, and sort of the middle class people or middle class white people, shall we say, who are, you know, the main audience of, still of cookery books. But I think there has been a democratization of food, of cookery books in general. I mean, Pinch of Nom, we don't talk about class enough about who writes mm. the um, food books, but, you know, Kate and Kay Allison, Allison are a um, couple of middle, uh, working class ladies from Merseyside. So mm-hmm. I, I don't, I, you know, if I look back at the best-selling cookery writers going back from now to, you know, 1990s, I, I think they're the only people who would, you know, describe themselves as working class. Mm. Um, and, you know, Joe Wicks, I think, you know, an Essex boy, uh, even though he's probably, well, <laughs> if you can afford his personal training lessons, you probably are middle class. But anyway, uh, he speaks directly to sort of working class, you know, sensibility, I think, and, the back, and it's a friendlier um, way to get into the cookery rather than we talk about this a lot at the, the bookseller and publishers are always talking about this, that um, buying books in Waterstones or, uh, you know, your posh independent bookshop is not easy for working class people because mm. it can be intimidating. Mm. Uh, and I'm not, and they're trying to figure out ways around that and reach out to different communities. Um, and this is particularly a difficult question for, cookery writing. Mm. B, can I ask you about diversity in food writing? You mentioned Yemisi Aribasala's Long Throat Memoirs, the, the, the Nigerian um, writer. Um, and I, I was thinking, actually, food writing has always been diverse to some degree. I was thinking about Ken Holm and Mada Jaffrey. But, but it, is, is the landscape becoming even more diverse? I think it is. There's a very significant food newsletter called Vittles that was set up by a food writer called Jonathan Nunn that has kind of consciously gone out in search of more diverse voices and also just different stories to tell about food. I think um, food, as it's been seen through the lens of newspapers rather than books, has had this very narrow view in Britain. It's either restaurant reviews of very high-end, specific, often Michelin-starred places, or it's recipes. And actually, as we've discussed, food writing can be so many other things, so many other cuisines. More voices do need to be heard. Um, There is a huge debate going on both here in the States about recipes and cultural appropriation. Mm. Um, You know, this idea of, you know, is it okay just to kind of take a recipe from someone else's cuisine and kind of refer to it as your 
own kind of Jamaican style or Persian style dish when actually you've never been to Jamaica or mm. Iran. Um, and I think that conversation is long overdue. And I, I don't think there's a perfect way to deal with it. I think I think you're completely right. And I think Ken Hong is an absolute hero. Mada Jaffrey too. And I've actually just been rereading some Mada Jaffrey um, for a review article I'm writing. Um, and it's kind of fascinating, the stuff that she was saying in the 70s, she was already having this debate in her first, I think it was her first cookbook, An Invitation to Indian Cooking. She said, you know, curry is a degrading word that had been borrowed from the British, sorry, borrowed by the British, from the Indians, by the British, and to then use in an even more crass way. And she was trying to reclaim the incredible regional diversity of Indian cuisine from this misrepresentation, as she saw it, of curry. Um, but then in pure market terms, as Tom would know better than I would, she then went on to write 10 or 12 or maybe even 20 books that had curry in the title. Um, so I think it was a kind of pragmatic recognition. OK, there are all of these people out there that completely misunderstand this cuisine and just reduce it to curry. But given that they misunderstand it, maybe I'm going to have to offer a helping hand and use that word as a way to then draw people in to learn about the real thing. This is such an interesting conversation and a, a lovely one because largely we're talking about writers that we like and food that we love. But can I encourage you to dish the dirt, as it were? How, how do you feel about celebrities from beyond the culinary world encroaching into food and food writing? I'm thinking of Drew Barrymore and Reese Witherspoon. Are, are you suspicious of those writers? B, you go first. I'm not suspicious of anyone that wants to write about food. I mean, I think I think it's funny. I think anyone should be allowed mm-hmm. to write about food because it's just such a human universal. Yes, I'm sure it's there are issues to do with. I mean, we, this issue we've raised about people getting credited for recipes, which takes many many forms. And I think what's very frustrating is if cookery writers who work extremely hard and don't necessarily sell many copies if their recipes are kind of lifted by someone else who does very well out of it. But I don't think there's any, there's no obvious prima facie reason why a celebrity shouldn't be able to write, you know, Sophia Loren wrote a cookbook, didn't she? I don't know if it's good. I haven't cooked from it, but I imagine it's great. Um, I think the more the merrier. I mean, there are two, having said that, there are way, way, way too many cookbooks in the world and I'm about to add to that um, yeah. last number. That was a very... A generous answer there Tom I'm relying on you to be more rude here um, no because I, I mean you can't be I'm, I'm assuming that they, they're, they're enormously successful these books too well pure celebrity cookbooks don't really do well no to be ah. honest um, well primarily because they come from America and they they only have a certain level that they're going to get to um, so and no, no one, no celeb in the UK has really had a crossover cookbook. Say, I don't know if uh, I'm trying to think of a if Anton Deck wanted to make a cookbook <laughs> or something like that. No, no one of that level has crossed over to to do a cookery book. There have been people who have been on the telly, who but they usually have sort of relationship with food already established. Um, I, I I do feel cynical about some of them, um, but you can tell right away, can't you? You can tell whose heart is in it and whose heart isn't. One one of my favorite celeb cookbooks is Snoop Dogg's from Crook really? to Cook. I did not it's... know there was a Snoop Dogg cookbook. <laughs> well, and and you think, oh, that's this is kind of a, a money grab, but he does have a TV show in America with Martha Stewart, and they cook. Wow. Um, um, but it's really funny, and you can tell his heart's behind it. Um, the Mexican uh, American actor uh, Denny Trejo. Um, He's one of those guys, character actors, who if you saw his face, you'd know who he is, but he usually plays a baddie in uh, action films. Uh, right. He has a really good Mexican cookbook out. but and I, and I thought this was a sort of money grab when I first picked it up, but it's he owns a couple of Mexican restaurants in L.A. and he grew up cooking. You know, he was the cook in his family when he was growing up, so... And Stanley Tucci, a good heart. So, people loved the Stanley Tucci memoir last year, didn't they? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> But again, again, that comes from a, a place that, you know, he obviously made that film Big Night, which I think is probably the best film about cooking ever. 
um, indie film from the, uh, must have been the 90s, about these two brothers. I don't know if you've seen it, but these two brothers who own this restaurant that's failing in New Jersey and because they cook authentic Italian food and they have to make this big meal, meal to try to save the restaurant. It's probably the best. Yeah, so, so Stanley Tucci's book came from a, a place of, you know, being grounded in food. Well, he had things to say about food for sure, didn't he? He had mm. he had authority yeah. on the subject, and I think I have, yeah, yes. So go and be. When I was also just somebody started some Twitter thread just this week about like what a weird genres of books, like written by an author who's generally known for something else and then branches out, and a lot of them seem to be cookbooks. You know, Len Dayton famously mm. wrote these um, kind of graphic cookbooks, didn't he, with cartoon strips? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think there are other examples. I'm now trying to remember from that thread. That's the only one I can picture. Okay. But I, I have to, I'm just reflecting on um, your imaginary example, Tom, of, of Anton Deck. And I'm just recalling that Anton Deck presents Saturday Night Takeaway. So I yes. think that would be mixed messages <laughs> if they started a cookbook. Um, let me ask you a final question, which is um, we know now to look up um, Snoop Dogg and Sophia Loren's cookbooks, but would you recommend a book for someone who's new to food writing? What, where, would they, where would they start be? I mean, I just think Claudia Roden is the best, really. I think her book of Middle Eastern food came out in the 60s. It just, people talk about Elizabeth David transforming the way the British ate. I think she was really the person who transformed the way the British ate. She described how her father came from Egypt in the 50s and, you know, there was no, the idea there'd be hummus in the shops, unimaginable. And now it's everywhere. And that's really partly because of her quiet, elegant influence. And her books are beautiful to read, but also meticulously tested you know they work so well and they're simple and she's influenced everyone from Ottolenghi to the brilliant Honey and Co writers um Itamar Srilovic and Sarit Packer so I think she's she's my absolute goddess Claudia Roden. Wonderful Tom? Um if we're talking about an entree into an entree <laughs> into uh cookery uh, is salmon Nazareth right, salt fat acid and heat um, which uh, I always get those words mixed up. I hope I put them in the right order. Uh, this is a, a book which I think just distills everything down to those core ingredients and it makes you prepared to, of what to do in the, in the kitchen. Um, she writes so well and dexterously about uh, the core of cookery and what makes cookery beautiful. Um, it's a beautiful object as well. One of the best um, designed cookbooks I've ever seen. And this is in a, we're in a period, I should say, where design of cookbooks are probably at the best it's ever been. Um, partially, to, this is probably on a whole other topic, but partially to kind of combat, combat against um, the internet. Um, but yeah, and there she has a companion Netflix series for anyone who wants to watch that as well. Wonderful. Thank you both, Tom Timlin and B. Wilson. This has been such an interesting and companionable conversation. And of course, everyone is now starving. Thank you too to the Blavlatnik Family Foundation for its generous support of this podcast. If you'd like to know more about the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction, you can visit the website or follow us on Twitter at BG Prize. Tune in next time to hear more from the world of literary nonfiction. Goodbye. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.